Welcome to Looking Beyond. I'm Linda Bonnell. Skeptics often say that UFOs only appear in remote areas, and there are rarely any credible witnesses to back up these fantastic stories. A recent UFO sighting took place over one of America's largest cities. What will those skeptics say this time? March 13th, 1997. UFOs were seen traveling over wide areas of the Southwest. In particular, hundreds of people saw a group of lights move over Phoenix, Arizona. Home to over 2.7 million people, Phoenix is a metropolitan oasis, not exactly a hotbed of UFO activity. Thursday, I was done watching TV about 10 o'clock, and I went outside to just check the yard before I turned in for the night, and I noticed a bright light up on the uh, Strea Mountains further to the east than I've ever s seen one before. Hey, Sue. Take a look at this. Oh, my God. Oh. That evening, I walked out my kitchen door at 10.20 p.m. to check on my son, who was doing some work on some rather large gates that we're building. My attention was called to what I first thought was an approaching formation of airplanes. I see it very clearly now, and if there was only a way to plug a wire into my head, I could give you a perfect description of it. There was a large... B-shaped formation of amber lights, very bright. It was roughly about 9.50. Um, we live out east of town, about 25 miles from where these lights were. Uh, were elevated on a desert uh, foothills. I walked outside on our back uh, deck just to do some chores, to shut some uh, irrigation off. Right there in the sky were the nine lights. Uh, they were just suspended. And it was actually looked like two objects close together, two orange objects. Then, about a minute and a half later, more of them started appearing. I got that Wait, one on video. There's just four of them. Look at the three of them all together. I got the third one popping forward here. There's one behind the chimney. Okay, one just fired up. I got four of them. Major sighting here. Thousands of people saw these lights. This amazing video footage has stirred an unprecedented media blitz and nationwide investigation. The Phoenix Lights may now be the most significant and well-documented UFO sighting in history. Our video ran all day on a local affiliate here March 14th. It was a huge story here in town, but it didn't take off nationally until, until the USA Today article, and then it's, it's just been gangbusters ever since. This footage has been shown on every national news broadcast and provoked the government to give a series of plausible explanations, including military maneuvers and National Guard flares. But witnesses and experts alike are not convinced. I don't know what it was, but um, I did get to go down to a local affiliate here that shot flares and looking at them, that there was no, there was consistency with the brightness, but that was it. The flares drifted into one another. You could see them moving where these lights were suspended. They didn't move. And I kind of shot that theory down, at least for me. I feel pretty certain that flares were shot off that night. But that's not what people saw and videotaped in Phoenix. Jim Dilatoso is a video expert who has been researching alleged UFO footage for over 20 years. He has reviewed most of the footage shot that evening. This is a videotape shot by Chuck Reardon, who lives in the far east part of the valley. At this point, the lights have been on, and now they're going off one at a time. Every single one of these lights we've studied for their optical characteristics. Jim studied the wave patterns of the Phoenix lights and compared them to the flares. In this image, we have the flares that have been shot by a local news crew that went down to the gunnery range. And you can see up here the red, green, and blue components of this flare light. It's an interesting wave. You can see that the red, green, and blue components form kind of a cluster. Now, let's go over to the light from the Mike Kristen Moon Valley shot, which we'll put on a graph down here. And let's look at this light. Now, the most obvious difference is that the light from the unknown shot by Mike Kristen is a clear wave shape where the components, red, green, and blue, are graphs that are right on top of each other. Jim went on to conclude that the red, 
green and blue graphs are at distinctly different levels. The lights themselves are extremely unique. We haven't been able to find a manufacturer of electronic, electric, or pyrotechnic lights who could actually make these lights. Who did make these lights? Recently, Phoenix City Councilwoman Frances Emma Barwood took the story to the City Council. And I said, could we look into why nobody's investigating these lights that flew over Phoenix and uh, find out what happened? And it was like the silence. After the meeting, I was told by one of the deputy city managers that I shouldn't have asked that question. The deputy city manager said that the mayor really didn't want to have to deal with it, that apparently there was a statement that was issued from his office saying there are no UFOs over Phoenix. Councilwoman Barwood has been ridiculed publicly and privately for her investigation. You know, this is my first experience with something like this, and, you know, people in general don't trust the government, and this is just giving them more ammunition to not trust the government. Honestly, I don't care what it was, but, you know, it, it really kind of made me wonder, is like, why nobody else was curious about it? Why doesn't our government want to know what it is? And the only reason that I can think that nobody wants to look into it is that they already know what it is. Whatever the lights were, it may not have been the first time these lights have been seen in Arizona. The tradition of aliens or star beings and their spacecraft may be recorded in ancient cave and rock art. I think one needs to understand that in Native American general, uh, star beings are parts and parcel of our very existence. I don't think that UFOs are anything new to Arizona. They seem to go back all the way into the first time we could draw on walls and paint and carve into stone. We are descended from them. So we are simply their offspring. They are our ancestors. One thing is for certain. Tom King and his fellow eyewitnesses are convinced that what they saw is extraterrestrial. You can't keep saying these things to the military when you got objects flying over downtown Phoenix at 8 o'clock, 8.30, over a mile long, and are transparent. I have yet to see the military roll out one of these off the production line. And when they do, I'll kiss the president's ass, but until then, that object is alien spacecraft, in my opinion. While Tom and his fellow Skywatchers continue to document the ongoing sightings, several questions remain. If this was an alien spacecraft, what was it doing in Phoenix? Former commercial pilot Trig Johnston believes that the object wanted to be seen. And it was paraded down Scottsdale Road, one of the busiest roads in the city, like a float in a rose bowl parade. It meant to be seen. It wanted to be seen. And one of the things was that we got the impression, and a lot of our friends have, uh, that I've spoken with who have seen this, is that you have kind of an impression that this is not a threat. It's a friendly. Friendly aliens or secret military projects? The answer hovers somewhere in the Arizona desert. Still a skeptic? You can choose not fire. To it's instinct. But what if you were the source of that fire and became a human fireball? You're about to meet a man who's been in that terrifying situation not once, but twice. It strikes without warning. Unsuspecting innocent victims suddenly and inexplicably burst into flames. The victim is almost totally incinerated. I was getting ready to go to work in the morning. I bent down to put on my boots. All I saw was just a cloud of smoke around me. My first response was padding, padding, padding to try and get whatever was burning to go out. When I started moving around, then the smoke started disappearing. And then, you know, by the time I found there was nothing there, the smoke was just about gone, then it just vanished. Peter was lucky. Almost all other accounts of spontaneous human combustion have proven fatal. This is a phenomenon that can affect just about anybody. Everything points to these fires beginning within the body and burning outward under conditions that belie common sense and what is commonly known about fire behavior and fire patterns at a fire scene. Dating back to the 16th century, spontaneous human combustion, also known as Hell's Fire, has baffled investigators. We should have answers for for a lot of these things, and we don't have the answers, at least I don't have the answers, for the spontaneous human combustion. Several people have fallen victim to the internal fire that almost took Peter Jones's life. Spontaneous human combustion remains the only credible explanation. But even with an open mind, 
the case of Dr. John Bentley is truly bizarre. Dr. John Bentley was a retired physician living alone in northern Pennsylvania, apparently in good health, but invalidic. The morning of December 5, his body was found literally to have self-cremated in his bathroom, leaving behind one lower leg as mute testimony that this pile of ash in the basement had once come from a living human being. Larry Arnold is a spontaneous human combustion researcher. His book, A Blaze, is an in-depth study of the global phenomenon. This is a cremation that should have required 3,000 degree temperatures for 12 hours to be present in Dr. Bentley's bathroom. The aluminum walker that Dr. Bentley used to help him move about his small apartment was intact. Aluminum will melt at 1,200 degrees. Common sense says the fire and heat rises in an inferno. Here, just the opposite occurred. The force of the combustion was inward and downward through the floor. The picture speaks for itself, but this is not the only well-documented case. Another fatality blamed on Hell's Fire is Helen Conway. A widow, a grandmother, who in 1964 was left alone one morning with her granddaughter while the rest of the family went to church service. Mrs. Conway asked her granddaughter to fetch her a pack of cigarettes. When the granddaughter returned from her errand, she discovered that her grandmother's room was filled with dark smoke. Within minutes, the fire department was on the scene. They were completely unprepared to see what was before their very eyes. Mrs. Conway left behind two legs propped up against the front of an easy chair. The rest of her body was basically a cinder. There was no other significant fire damage in her apartment. One remarkable thing of many about the Conway case is the time factor. Within no more than six minutes, she burned so completely and quickly that it could be more characterized as not simply spontaneous human combustion, but spontaneous human explosion. Hell's Fire is an indiscriminate killer, usually attacking at night. Jack Angel met Hell's Fire and survived. In 1974, Jack Angel parked his motor home in Savannah, Georgia, and retired therein for the night. Sometime during that night's sleep, a two-life nightmare befell Jack Angel. He discovered that sometime during his long sleep, his right hand had been charred black, burned to a crisp, he told us. He also had strange burn wounds on his right chest, on the back of his neck, and in other parts of his body. And yet his pajamas that he was wearing during this time had not been singed. The sheets on which his body lay were not burned in any fashion. Physicians who treated Jack Angel wrote on their medical documents that Jack's burns were, quote, internal in origin. Jack Angel survived just as Peter Jones did. But unlike Jack, Peter had yet another brush with the unholy flame. We decided not to tell anybody. It's like seeing a flying saucer. You know, it's, <laughs> uh, people just wouldn't believe you, I don't think. While driving home on the same day of the first attack, Peter was engulfed in smoke yet again. All of a sudden, it just started pouring out of my arms. And then I kind of like, whoa. <laughs> and I tried to, you know, brush it off. As my hand passed over my arm, the smoke just kept coming out and just uh, filled the car full of smoke. And then uh, it stopped and the smoke was just disappeared out the window. Peter has lived to tell what others have not. But to this day, Peter fears the fire from hell. Hopefully that'll be the last of it. I definitely don't want it to happen again. I would not want to end up a pile of ashes on the floor. Spontaneous human combustion is extremely rare, but it never hurts to keep fresh batteries in your smoke alarm, just in case. We'll be right back. Coming up, a fatal auto accident nearly killed this young girl. She really was a miracle. But was the miracle her glimpse of the other side? I think you just pull back the veil and let her see a little bit of heaven. If you're not a believer, you might be after this girl's story. And heaven is certain. She's been there. It was the afternoon of April 4th. Cheryl Dial was in her car with her five-year-old daughter, Ashley, and her baby boy, Daniel. They were on their way to have a family photo taken for an upcoming Easter holiday. But out of nowhere, a car came careening toward them at 70 miles per hour. The driver's seat was a man who had been drinking all night. Seven people were killed, including Ashley's mother and her little brother, Daniel. Cheryl's parents, Robert and Joan Fricke, had retired to the small town of Herman, Missouri to be closer to their only daughter and their grandchildren, Ashley and Daniel. 
When they came home that night, they found a note on their door from their pastor asking them to call him as soon as they returned. Well, we made a few phone calls and, and the lines were busy. We got nothing but busy signal. And about that time, we noticed that headlights were coming down our driveway. And uh, it was our deacon that came and uh, broke the news to us. <laughs> Five-year-old Ashley was the only survivor of the accident. Rescue workers found her buried alive beneath what was left of the dashboard. Her mother's dead body enveloped her, trying to shield her from the deadly crash. Ashley was airlifted 70 miles to Columbia Hospital in a desperate attempt to save her life. Her injuries were massive and included a crushed left leg, a collapsed lung, and severe head trauma. The little girl was losing her brave battle and slipped into a coma. Doctors warned her family that she had little hope for recovery. The pain, the sorrow, the hurt comes from a depth in you that you have no idea. It totally rips you apart. Just two weeks later, little Ashley emerged from her coma. Strangely enough, it was on Easter Sunday. Dr. Hellickson from uh, University Hospital called. Ashley's out of the coma. So we went in the room and Ashley says, my grandma, my cramps. Therapist Karen Moore saw Ashley every day to try and help her adjust to a life without her mother and baby brother Daniel. From their first meeting, Karen realized that this little girl was very special. Her recovery was miraculous because she could not only speak, recognized people, but she could also drink and eat, and it was, it, she really was a miracle. What happened next profoundly touched everyone surrounding Ashley. It was an experience they would never forget. While we were talking to her, Ashley was faced towards us, and then she looked away from us and, and looked up the ceiling, and her voice was very weak and shallow, and I couldn't hear everything she was saying. But she said, Daniel, Daniel, Mom. And she carried on a conversation with her and smiled but nod her head. But when she raised her hand and went like this, and she spoke up loud enough to hear, and she was saying, Goodbye, Mom. I love you. Hi, Daniel. I love you. And then turned back to us, pointed up to the ceiling. She says, can you see the pole? Can you see them? Can you see them? And she kept repeating it. Can you see them? Can you see the hole? She said to me that Mom had been there with her when she was in the coma, encouraging her to come out of it. And she was lying in bed, and she'd raise her little eyes up as far as she could and she said they went that way they went up and I was going with them and they stopped and said you can't go you have to stay it's not your time and so she said I'm here and they're in heaven she just seemed so at peace with it like mom had gone off to work and she knew where she was, no big deal. Had Ashley truly been shown a glimpse of heaven to help her transition back from the dead, her grandmother was convinced she had. I think he just pulled back the veil and let her see a little bit of heaven to help her. Months later, Ashley was released from the hospital. Five years after that, she still recalls that incredible night. In heaven, it's bright like that. And it's so bright with the sun was shining on it, and there's never any dark. I saw my mom, and I saw the man. The man told me I had to go back. And my mom said she loved me, and then that's all I remember. <laughs> Ashley now lives at home with her grandparents and is a happy and healthy young girl. Recently, Karen Moore paid the family a visit. <laughs> Ashley's a miracle child. She blessed me tremendously by being able to work with her. I have a, a very strong religious belief, but to have to have a small child take your blinders off is very humbling. Um, she just was so positive. Heaven is there.
many times that I cry, Ashley will pat me on my back and say, Grandma, it's okay. Mom's in heaven and she's happy. The miracle of life is best seen through the innocent eyes of a child, especially a child who's experienced the miracle of death. If heaven is a place where souls can find peace, and angels are spirits that comfort the living, then brave little Ashley Dial has seen both. We'll be back in a moment. Coming up, it's a special looking beyond profile. There were these little um, short off-white beings, naked guys with uh, big black eyes, uh, doing things from a world to come forward with their experiences. We'd like you to meet one such person. I grew up in the Midwest, uh, a typical Midwestern family, a Christian upbringing. I went to a Baptist church. I was in the middle of uh, two brothers. I have a brother who's seven years older and a brother who's seven years younger. My mom used to call us her seven-year itch. And uh, my mother was a hairstylist and my father was an entrepreneur. And I, you know, went to school, normal school, public school, graduated from high school and uh, came to California. I woke up and I was not in my bed any longer. I was standing in what I thought was an elevator. I was paralyzed. Um, I had no idea how I could have been taken from my bed in the middle of the night and not known it and just appeared in this elevator, but that was the case. I was pushed into a room that I describe as a, a large hospital ward. Um, there were tiny little tables about a foot and a half uh, tall all through this hospital ward and there were uh, unconscious human beings laying on all of these tables and there were these little um, short off-white beings naked guys with uh, big black eyes uh, doing things to these people on these tables I was taken into a small room and I was presented a little girl about two years old and uh, she was beautiful she was very human looking she had big blue eyes and long blonde hair but she lacked emotion and they presented this child to me and they said to me, isn't she a beautiful baby? And telepathically, they were communicating to me that it was my child. And I was absolutely in shock. I'm in this room and I'm, I'm seeing this two-year-old little girl and they're telling me it's mine. And I'm saying, you're crazy. This isn't mine. It can't be mine. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, leave me alone. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to participate in this. I know how crazy it sounds for a woman to say she's been implanted with an alien fetus. I'm an intelligent woman, I'm highly educated, I know how the world perceives it, but I'm sorry, it's the truth. I hate that idea that I'm a messenger, you know. Um, I'm just a normal person who happens to know too much. I know too much. I've seen the future, I've seen the world from another perspective. And, uh, I can just talk about it if that makes me a messenger. I, maybe I'm a messenger, I don't know. But that message is out there, you know? It's not, it's like how many times can we be told something? Not, uh, apparently not enough. Looking ahead. Like two hot hands grabbed my wrist and started dragging me under my parents' bed. We, we put the light on and, and you could actually see his arms extended over his head and see him being dragged. My mom, she was just screaming. At Looking Beyond, or if you have an unusual story, rare photographs, or videotape evidence of a paranormal nature, please contact us at the following mailing address. 8306 Wilshire Boulevard, Suite 768, Beverly Hills, California, 90211. Thank you for joining us. For Looking Beyond, I'm Linda Bonnell. to the east than I've ever s seen one before. Hey, Sue, take a look at this. Oh, my God. Oh. That evening, I walked out my kitchen door at 10.20 p.m. to check on my son who was doing some work on some rather large gates that we're building. My attention was called to what I first thought was a approaching formation of airplanes. I 
can see it very clearly now. And if there was only a way to plug a wire into my head, I could give you a perfect description of it. It was a large V-shaped formation of amber lights, very bright. It was roughly about 9.50. Um, we live out east of town, about 25 miles from where these lights were. Uh, were elevated on a desert uh, foothills. I walked outside on our back uh, deck. Delitoso is a video expert who has been researching alleged UFO footage for over 20 years. He has reviewed most of the footage shot that evening. This is a videotape shot by Chuck Reardon, who lives in the far east part of the valley. At this point, the lights have been on, and now they're going off one at a time. Every single one of these lights we've studied for their optical characteristics. Jim studied the wave patterns of the Phoenix lights and compared them to the flares. In this image, we have the flares that have been shot by a local news crew that went down to the gunnery range. And you can see up here the red, green, and blue components of this flare light. It's an interesting wave. You can see that the red, green, and blue components form kind of a cluster. Now, blood. Welcome to Looking Beyond. I'm Linda Bonnell. Skeptics often say that UFOs only appear in remote areas, and there are rarely any credible witnesses to back up these fantastic stories. A recent UFO sighting took place over one of America's largest cities. What will those skeptics say this time? March 13, 1997. UFOs were seen traveling over wide areas of the Southwest. In particular, hundreds of people saw a group of lights move over Phoenix, Arizona. Home to over 2.7 million people, Phoenix is a metropolitan oasis, not exactly a hotbed of UFO activity. Thursday I was done watching TV about 10 o'clock, and I went outside to just check the yard before I turned in for the night, and I noticed a bright light up on the uh, Strea Mountains. But it didn't take off nationally until till the USA Today article, and then it's, it's just been gangbusters ever since. This footage has been shown on every national news broadcast and provoked the government to give a series of plausible explanations, including military maneuvers and National Guard flares. But witnesses and experts alike are not convinced. I don't know what it was, but um, I did get to go down to a local affiliate here that shot flares and looking at them, that there was no, there was consistency with the brightness, but that was it. The flares drifted into one another. You could see them moving where these lights were suspended. They didn't move. And I kind of shot that theory down, at least for me. I feel pretty certain that flares were shot off that night. But that's not what people saw and videotaped in Phoenix. Jim D Just to do some chores, to shut some uh, irrigation off. Right there in the sky were the nine lights. Uh, they were just suspended. And it was actually looked like two objects close together, two orange objects. Then, about a minute and a half later, more of them started appearing. I got that Wait, one on video. There's just four of them. Look at the three of them all together. I got the third one popping before you. There's one behind the chimney. One just fired up. I got four of them. Major sighting here. Thousands of people saw these lights. This amazing video footage has stirred an unprecedented media blitz and nationwide investigation. The Phoenix Lights may now be the most significant and well-documented UFO sighting in history. Our video ran all day on a local affiliate here, March 14th, and it was a huge story here in town. 